So hi, I'm Joanne. Today I'm going to talk about my project, which is integration of quantum dot nanoparticles with multimodal microsphere for PET and Cherenkov luminescence imaging of cancer. I'd like to start with um, just a little background on molecular imaging. It has become an indispensable tool in biomedical research by providing, providing spatially resolved molecular information for drug development and diagnosis of different diseases. Take an example, this is the, so to, for nuclear imaging such as MRI, PET, or CT, it has been very useful in both the research and clinical setting because they provide very valuable information both structural and functional. But recently there has been a new development which is the ability to optically visualize radioactive decay signals from medical isotopes, which is a really good way to bridge the information acquired from nuclear and optical imaging. And it's particularly useful because there are some medical isotopes for such as, well, the ones that are for treating um, cancer that are, they are radioactive, but the signals itself cannot be observed using PET or SPEC. So when we c come to treating patients, we don't know if we're giving the right dose or if the treatment is being delivered to the right location. And this way of optically visualizing the radioactive decay is a new way of, or so far the only way to look at some of these isotopes. So that leads us to look at this imaging modality called Cherenkov luminescence or CL imaging. It's a type of radioluminescence that's, that are emitted when charged particles travel faster than the phase velocity of light in the dielectric medium. And if you look up pictures of a radio reactor, this is usually what you will see. You will see this really beautiful blue glowing light that's actually not you know, caused by an uh, exterior source such as you know, other kind of light. It's coming from the radioactive decay itself. And this process is best described using the Frank Tim formula uh, that are shown here. And the really um, the key, the two take home messages from this equation is that first, uh, CL emission, it's a continuous emission and it is stronger at shorter wavelengths, which is why it, when we can, when our human eyes can see it, it's, it appears as blue. And also the emission intensity increases with higher refractive index. And in terms of radio reactor, it is, in, it is water, which is higher, higher than the air, and that's why we can, and it's stronger, it will get stronger as the refractive index of the medium um, gets higher. So, um, and reason, so this type of luminescence has been discovered many, many years ago, but it has become a relatively new topic in biomedical imaging because now people found out that a lot of the medical isotopes such as uh, fluorine 18 or copper 64 that are uh, approved for medical imaging actually also emit these, this type of luminescence. So that's why people started to using it to, for biomedical imaging. But the thing is that you saw the picture earlier, the uh, emission is it's blue light. So that's not really good for in vivo or tissue imaging because blue light is, t tends to be high, highly absorbed in the tissue by the hemoglobin. So to make it better for tissue imaging, we want to kind of shift the emission to our longer wavelength, so in the red region. And we want to um, accomplish that by using, by, uh, using this protein microspheres we develop in our group but, and incorporating the near infrared quantum dot nanoparticles as a way to make this shift. And also we want to, and this is how we will do it. So um, this is originally the CO emission. We want to use it instead of external UV light to excite the quantum dots. And the emission that come out of it, which we'll call um, CL excited quantum dot fluorescence, will be the signal that we actually want to acquire from the tissue. And of course, we want to use these multimodal microspheres for, for in vivo targeting of tumor. So let me introduce the, uh, my um, protein microsphere that's shown here. This is the images of SEM and TEM just to show what they look like. And outside the gray shell, that's the, that's we use, we have BSA protein shell, and the red dots inside are the near infrared uh, quantum dots that are encapsulated in an oil core. And it's actually just vegetable oil, and it has an even higher refractive index than water, which, and it sits at around 1.46, where water is 1.33. So like I mentioned earlier, supposedly it will help us to um, enhance the CL emission. And outside here, we have them uh, labeled with copper 64, which will be our initial 
tricolumescence emission source. And of course, they will be pegylated for um, in vivo circulation, which I'll talk about more later. And they are functionalized with cyclic RGD for targeting alpha V beta 3 integrin that I will also talk about more later. And first, we want to see, so like we know just from the equation and uh, intrinsic characteristics of tranquiluminescence, it should increase with um, high refractive index. But of course, we want to first prove that that is still true using our microsphere. So what we did here, this is three different types of microspheres with no quantum dots, but different core on, with different refractive indices. The first one here, which you can barely see, it's made with fluorine carbon material, and the index is sitting around 1.25, so even lower than water. And the middle, it's vegetable oil, 1.46, the one we actually used for this study. And the, this, this one, the last one is wintergreen oil, and it's 1.54, so the highest of all. And we see that, in, in, indeed, when we have a microsphere core of higher refract index, we do see an increase in um, CO emission coming from the microspheres. So next step, we compare that to micros these um, oil microsphere. Oh, and you might wonder why I don't. So since wintergreen is so great, why don't I use it? But the thing is that when you have too much in wintergreen, it's actually toxic to our body. So we choose vegetable oil in the end. But OK, so on the right side here, here we come. So on the left side, this is the vegetable oil microspheres with no quantum dots. On the right side here, this is the oil microspheres that have the near infrared quantum dots in there. So on the left side here, we see that um, the microspheres, the emission, the emission are stronger in the shorter wavelength, so toward the blue region, which is ex expected because inside there's no quantum dots and you no, know, just the, the charcoal car luminescence and the oil. On the right side, now we incorporate quantum dots. You see this, the, the emission has shifted. Now you see a stronger emission in the you know, longer wavelength region where, where around the red region. So that's good. So next we um, compare our quantum dot nano uh, microspheres with just copper 64 SSL, which will be a just pure charcoal luminescence source. We see that through tissue at uh, longer wavelengths, our microspheres are giving much higher signal intensity compared to um, just copper 64 by itself. So this is great. And now next, we want to see if our microspheres can be used for targeting. We use cyclic RGD to target the alpha V beta 3 integrin that are usually overexpressed in newly formed blood vessels that are grown around that are formed around the tumor. So to take note that we're not trying to target the tumor, but we want to find the site where there's tumor, because we know atherosclerosis is one of the earlier step of uh, tumor. And so we use MDA MB, MB231, which is a human breast cancer cell line that are no, that's known to express alpha V beta 3 integrin. We find that, it's, which is great, the targeted microsphere is showing significantly higher targeting than the non-targeted and the control. And next, we also tried using the targeting using MCF7, which is another breast cancer cell line that does not express alpha V beta 3 integrin. And indeed, we don't see really anything except some um, non-specific binding. So from here, we, th we said that our microsphere, they are targeting the alpha V beta 3 integrin, and not just because they're cancer cell lines. So um, before we move on to in vivo circulation, we first need to look at this in vivo circulation time, because we know when you send in a foreign object, su such as contrast agent, our body tries to get rid of them through uh, our system, like in the, through spleen, uh, liver, and also just, and just exit the, uh, the body. But um, people often use this method of pegylation as a way to camouflage the contrast agent and prolong the circulation time. So, in terms of labeling, we tried a couple of different parameters, such as the types of pegs, so whether they're longer or shorter, and also um, the labeling ratio, higher or lower. We find that the longer peg, the 5K peg, at a higher labeling ratio show much, um, there's a much uh, longer in vivo circulation time by looking at the percent injected dose per gram. So we use a higher labeling ratio of one to five. And then we use dynamic PET to look at how the microspheres circulate in, um, in the body. And here, so we can look, we can look at, uh, as time goes on, what's the change in the injected, uh, the percent injected dose per gram. In the blood, 
we see that, um, oh, the red line is the pegylated microspheres, and the black line is the non-pegylated one. We see the pegylated microspheres show a higher percent of uh, microsphere remain in the blood uh, after 30 minutes. So this is a great news. We also look at liver and spleen. So in the liver, you see initially if it's non-pegylated, we, we have a high shoot up in the beginning in the liver, and then it starts to decrease. And usually that means you know your agent it starts to leave your body; they're exiting. But when we had the micro, we had the pegylated microsphere. It's a much slower increase. So it's a slower build up. I mean, they will still eventually end up in the liver, but now it's a it takes longer, so that will give us more time to find where the tumors are. And in the spleen, we see similar uh, results, is that instead of a high um, increase in the spleen and then fast decrease, we, we saw the opposite. So this tells us that the pegylated microspheres, they're showing a longer circulation time. So now we moved on to in vivo targeting. We use a rat model to target the mammary tumor, and then we'll, um, we use, we use uh, in vivo PET as a way to verify that if we are seeing any signal coming from the tumor, this is where the, this is from the PET and PET CT, this is where the tumor is. So with that information in mind, we perform ex vivo CL, CLFL imaging. So here on the left, this is the target, this is using the targeted microspheres. On the right is a non-targeted. Just from the intensity map, you can see, map, you can see the targeted microspheres are showing a stronger CLFL signal, and it is actually much, significantly stronger than the non-targeted. But of course, we, want, we always want, this is a relatively new type of imaging modality. We want to verify that using something that we believe, we trust more, which is you no know, standard fluorescence imaging. This is the same piece of tumors. And then we use, we use fluorescence dark box, dark box to look at the signal. And then we, we got similar result, which is you know, the, tar the targeted tumor shows a better, um, much, much higher targeting in the tumor. So, we 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 um we conclude that first our microspheres can be used for targeting you know the tumor sites or actually the more more the, of like the new blood vessels that are formed around the tumor and also um, CLFL imaging can be used for um, tumor imaging and then the next thing we did is um, since you know the new blood vessels around the tumor is not the only place that overexpress these alpha V beta three integrin in fact atherosclerotic plaques that are formed on the aorta, they actually also overexpress this type of integrin. And so we try, why not, let's try to target these as well, because it's a, it is a problem because atherosclerotic sclerosis, usually they're often not discovered until much later when the plaques erupt in your aorta and give a heart attack. So, but there isn't really a cell line that we can directly t test to target the plaque. So we use human umbilical vein endoth uh, endothelial cell line instead because this is a cell line that overexpress alpha V beta 3 integrin. And we saw similar results as the cancer case where we had much higher targeting using the targeted microspheres. So with that in mind, we move on to in vivo targeting. This is a similar procedure as the tumor targeting. We started with in vivo PET CT and where I'm, sh so look at the CT where I'm pointing out here, there's, you can kind of see a white shadow as it's about this big, that's where the heart is. And usually aorta will come out of here and go downward where it leads to, where it divides and leads to the, the blood vessels that go into the rest of your body. And usually these plaques like tend to form around the aorta tip. So you would expect if anything, hopefully we'll see some pet signals around the roof the tip of the aorta here, and that's exactly what we see here. So that's really that's really good news. And then similar um, method, we moved on to ex vivo imaging. So it's not as noticeable compared to tumor because rat aortas are really small. The diameter is only around maybe three millimeters. So their plaques are also small. And also keep in mind that rats, there it's it's really hard to give them atherosclerosis because they're just. They're just so, so healthy, they, they're immune to almost everything. And these rats were on a uh, high fat diet um, for actually a year. And they got really, really fat, but they still appear really healthy. So, <laughs> I know. Yeah, in the, basically we, they were on, you can say they're, they were, it's like they're eating McDonald's every day for a year and they were still fine. But anyway, so you would expect the plaques to be much smaller. But if you compare it to the non-targeted microspheres, you see that in the targeted one, we can see some uh, isolated um, 
yellow dots along the aorta while in the non-target we see nothing. And when we measure the average intensity, that's exactly what we see. So of course, again, we verify this result using fluorescence imaging. And you see that the, fluores the, the location where we got the fluorescence signals, they're very similar to where we saw the CLFL signal. They're not exactly the same because first, it's different, different modality, so there's different sensitivity in our detector. Also, we know these often tissues give out of fluorescence that sometimes you just can't clear them out um, completely, which brings out the nice thing about CLFL imaging that's basically zero out of fluorescence from tissue. And so basically, we, well, in the end, we got similar results using fluorescence imaging. So that confirms our um, CLFL imaging. And one step further, we did histology on these aorta. So first, on the right here, this is taken at the location where I draw a green line. And this is what a normal aorta tissue will look like. You have a very nicely stratified um, tissue layer with the almost, you can, almost can't see, but a really thin, endothelial layer cell. But on the left side here, where it was taken uh, on this, along this white line, you see a thickening of the endothelial layer. Then that's the beginning of uh, atherosclerotic plaque forming. You see thickening, and actually where I'm pointing here, this is where the, where the plaques start, uh, are forming. So uh, that confirms that our microspheres actually can target these plaques too. And CLFL imaging still works here. So just to summarize, um, I showed that we successfully fabricated these multimodal copper 64 labeled protein microspheres with quantum dots encapsulated with them. And they, uh, they uh, successfully shifted the blue wavelengths um, tranquiluminescence toward a uh, longer wavelength region of CLFL. And we show that the cyclic RGD functionalized microsphere, they can, we show that they can be used for targeting alpha v beta 3 integrin in both the cancer cell lines and also the HUVEX. And we demonstrated in vivo targeting of both tumor and atherosclerotic plaques. And we also showed that. We also showed ex vivo tranquiluminescence excited fluorescence imaging. It will show that it's feasible in both of uh, this type of detection. So, in the end, I want to thank everyone in my group for their support, especially my advisor, Dr. Stephen Bopar. And also, I want to thank our collaborators, Dr. Jabruki and Dr. Katzen Bogan, for their help on imaging and consultation. And of course, MCNTC for providing the funding for the research. Thanks. <laughs> questions? We have about like five minutes for questions if people have questions. Did I bore you? <laughs> What process did you use to make the nanoparticles? I mean, not the nanoparticles. Quantum the, uh, dots? Uh, yeah. I bought well, not, them. Not the quantum dots. The, uh, <laughs> the, the microsphere? How, how did you put them yeah, in the microsphere? We use an uh, ultrasonic tip that's for, that's, that's like making motion. So, because mm -hmm. so, you know, if you mix BSA solution and oil, it's going to form two layers. Yeah. And we, uh, we, uh, indu we give ultrasound at the interface. And that's, it's like making motion. And then, and then just as, it's like, think how like, when you rub uh, soap, soap, you know, so they all form these little bubbles that encapsulate the oil part inside and with the hydrophilic part outside. Okay. So, yeah. Yes? How do you excite the cherry green copper with the essence You don't excite, it just, it happens naturally. So isotopes, uh, the moment they exist, because Think of them as, so they're just the same atoms as the rest of the atoms we see on the periodic table, but the difference is that they're, they're highly unstable. And we know everything wants to reach equilibrium where it's stable. So that's what it does. It's decaying until it's stable. And during that process, when that, when that decay is happening, say, in the water or in the oil, because the, the, uh, the charged particles, in this case, it's a positron, so a positive electron, as it's traveling through the water, that speed, so think of, um, like, it's like, um, oh, sure, I forgot. But anyways, when, um, when it's, so because we know light travels the fastest in vacuum, right? And in water, that speed will slow down. So basically, it's when that electron, when it starts to um, travel faster than the speed of light in that medium, that's when you start seeing the um, tranquiluminescence. Yes? Within a couple of millimeter. 
So you do a couple millimeters because you ha um, it has to um, travel a little bit for that to happen. So yes, you need a group of microspheres to really locate around the tumor site for to really see that light. I mean, which is fine because we want them to target. So it's, so it's like one microsphere excited to point out in, in another. Kind of like yeah, so it's like they're it's like they're working together, they're exciting each other. Mm -hmm. Claire, you have a question? No, no. This is probably. Um, so you were worried about toxicology with wintergreen oils. Mm -hmm. What type of quantum dots do you use, and are you taking into account toxicology? Yeah, but um, <laughs> but since you no, know, they're they are encapsulated within the microspheres, and we've shown that it's a, it's pretty stable for a period of time. So our hypothesis is that since they're within the BSA shell and the oil, that it's not in direct contact with, you know, the rest of our body. But I am aware of that. <laughs> but quantum dots work so great, so great. <laughs> I have one more. I have a couple, two, two questions that would be. So first, I'm just curious how the radiation of the hybrid isotope will interfere with the rest of the connection, say within the photo that I mm, So. We use a CCD camera, and um, it's so I'm trying to think because sometimes I do get these really bright pop-up signal out of nowhere in the detector, but it's a it's really rare. So really, when I when what's being captured by the CCD, it's still mostly you know from the tissue itself and. And that doesn't happen always, but that, that does happen sometimes. But it has to, you know, hit the director directly. And but usually that process is going random; it's everywhere. So, yeah. If does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Another quick question. So, is there any reason to choose micro size particle instead of nanosphere? I'm sorry. What? Is there any special reason to choose microspheres instead of nanospheres? Yeah. So one reason is because when we make them, it's it's not so small, but we have uh, data from the past that shows we can alter their size so they will be smaller. But another thing we thought of was uh, so now it's like a little capsule, and if we can, you know, say further modify in the future, they can be a, a drug carrier. So that was kind of the reason why we went for that design. Because it's really versatile, it's like you can change the content, you can change what you encapsulate it within. Like in the past, we also, instead of quantum dots, we encapsulate iron oxide. Then we can do magnetic OCT imaging. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do this like multifunctional, multi, um, yeah. Okay, let's thank Joanne. Thanks.